We continue today with chapter 22, The Light of the Holy Relationship. Do you want freedom of the body or of the mind? For both you cannot have. Which do you value? Which is your goal? For one you see as means, the other end. And one must serve the other and lead to its predominance, increasing its importance by diminishing its own. Means serve the end, and as the end is reached, the value of the means decreases, eclipsed entirely when they are recognized as functionless. No one but yearns for freedom and tries to find it, yet he will seek for it where he believes it is and can be found. He will believe it is possible of mind or body, and he will make the others serve his choice as means to find it. Where freedom of the body has been chosen, the mind is used as means whose value lies in its ability to contrive ways to achieve the body's freedom. Yet freedom of the body has no meaning, and so the mind is dedicated to serve illusions. This is a situation so contradictory and so impossible that anyone who chooses this has no idea of what is valuable. Yet even in this confusion so profound it cannot be described, the Holy Spirit waits in gentle patience as certain of the outcome as he is sure of his Creator's love. He knows this mad decision was made by one as dear to his Creator as love is to itself. Be not disturbed at all to think how he can change the role of means and ends so easily in what God loves and would have free forever. But be you rather grateful that you can be the means to serve his end. This is the only service that leads to freedom. To serve this end, the body must be perceived as sinless because the goal is sinlessness. The lack of contradiction makes the soft transition from means to end as easy as is the shift from hate to gratitude before forgiving eyes. You will be sanctified by one another, using your bodies only to serve the sinless, and it will be impossible for you to hate what serves, whom you would heal. This holy relationship, lovely in its in innocence, mighty in strength, and blazing with a light far brighter than the sun that lights the sky you see, is chosen of your Father as a means for his own plan. Be thankful that it serves yours not at all. Nothing entrusted to it can be misused, and nothing given it but will be used. This holy relationship has the power to heal all pain, regardless of its form. Neither alone can serve at all. Only in your joint will does healing lie. For here your healing is, and here will you accept atonement. And in your healing is the sonship healed, because you, your wills are joined. Before a holy relationship there is no sin. The form of error is no longer seen, and reason, joined with love, looks quietly on all confusion, observing merely, this was a mistake. And then the same atonement you accepted in your relationship corrects the error, and lays a part of heaven in its place. How blessed are you who let this gift be given. Each part of heaven that you bring is given you, and every place in heaven that you will fill again with the eternal light you bring shines now on you. The means of sinlessness can know no fear because they carry only love with them. Child of peace, the light has come to you. The light you bring you do not recognize and yet you will remember. Who can deny himself the vision that he brings to others? And who would fail to recognize a gift he let be laid in heaven through himself? The gentle service that you give the Holy Spirit is service to yourself. 
You who are now his means must love all that he loves. And what you bring is your remembrance of everything that is eternal. No trace of anything in time can long remain in minds that serve the timeless. And no illusion can disturb the peace of a relationship that has become the means of peace. When you have looked upon your brother with complete forgiveness, from which no error is excluded and nothing kept hidden, what mistake can there be anywhere you cannot overlook? What form of suffering could block your sight, preventing you from seeing past it? And what illusion could there be you will not recognize as a mistake, a shadow through which you walk completely undismayed? God would let nothing interfere with those whose wills are His, and they will recognize their wills are His, because they serve His will, and serve it willingly. And could remembrance of what they are be long delayed? You will see your value through your brother's eyes, and each one is released as he beholds his Savior in place of the attacker who he thought was there. Through this releasing is the world released. This is your part in bringing peace. For you have asked, what is your function here, and have been answered. Seek not to change it, nor to substitute another goal. Accept this one and serve it willingly, for what the Holy Spirit does with gifts you give each other, to whom he offers them, and where and when is up to him. He will bestow them where they are received and welcomed. He will use every one of them for peace. Nor will one little smile or willingness to overlook the tiniest mistake be lost to anyone. What can it be but universal blessing to look on what your Father loves with charity? Extension of forgiveness is the Holy Spirit's function. Leave this to Him. Let your concern be only that you give to Him that which can be extended. Save no dark secrets that He cannot use, but offer Him the tiny gifts He can extend forever. He will take each one and make of it a potent force for peace. He will withhold no blessing from it, nor limit it in any way. He will join to it all the power that God has given Him to make each little gift of love a source of healing for everyone. Each little gift you offer to your brother lights up the world. Be not concerned with darkness. Look away from it and toward each other, and let the darkness be dispelled by him who knows the light and lays it gently in each quiet smile of faith and confidence with which you bless your brother. On your learning, thousands depend upon the welfare of the world. And it is only arrogance that would deny the power of your will. Think you the will of God is powerless? Is this humility? You do not see what this belief has done. See yourself as vulnerable, frail, and easily destroyed and at the mercy of countless attackers more powerful than you. Let us look straight at how this error came about, for here lies buried the heavy anchor that seems to keep the fear of God in place, immovable and solid as a rock. While this remains, so will it seem to be. Who can attack the Son of God and not attack his Father? How can God's Son be weak and frail and easily destroyed unless His Father is? You do not see that every sin and every condemnation that you perceive and justify is an attack upon your Father. And that is why it has not happened, nor could be real. You do not see that this is your attempt because you think the Father and the Son are separate. And you must think that they are separate because of fear. For it seems safer to attack another or yourself than to attack the great creator of the universe, whose power you know. If you were one with God and recognized this oneness, you would know his power is yours. But you will not remember this while you believe attack of any kind means anything. 
it is unjustified in any form because it has no meaning. The only way it could be justified is if each one of you were separate from the other and all were separate from your Creator. For only then would it be possible to attack a part of the creation without the whole, the Son without the Father, and to attack another without yourself or hurt yourself without the other feeling pain. And this belief you want, yet wherein lies its value, except in the desire to attack in safety. Attack is neither safe nor dangerous, it is impossible. And this is so because the universe is one. You would not choose attack on its reality if it were not essential to attack to see it separated from its maker. And thus it seems as if love could attack and become fearful. Only the different can attack. So you conclude because you can attack you must be different. Yet does the Holy Spirit explain this differently? Because you are not different you cannot attack. Either position is logical conclusion. Either could be maintained but never both. The only question to be answered in order to decide which must be true is whether you are different. From the position of what you understand you seem to be and therefore can attack. On the alternatives this seems more natural and more in line with your experience and therefore it is necessary that you have other experiences more in line with truth to teach you what is natural and true. This is the function of your holy relationship for what one thinks the other will experience with him. What can this mean except your minds are one? Look not with fear upon this happy fact and think not that it lays a heavy burden on you. For when you have accepted it with gladness you will realize that your relationship is a reflection of the union of the Creator and His Son. From loving minds there is no separation and every thought in one brings gladness to the other because they are the same. Joy is unlimited because each shining thought of love extends its being and creates more of itself. There is no difference anywhere in it for every thought is like itself. The light that joins you shines throughout the universe and because it joins you so it makes you one with your Creator and in Him is all creation joined. Would you regret you cannot fear alone when your relationship can also teach the power of love is there which makes all fear impossible. Do not attempt to keep a little of the ego with this gift for it was given you to be used and not obscured. What teaches you that you cannot separate denies the ego? Let truth decide if you be different or the same and teach you which is true. And from the workbook lesson 179, God is but love and therefore so am I. There is one life and that I share with God. God is but love and therefore so am I. Your grace is given me. I claim it now. God is but love and therefore so am I. Amen.